Hello, everybody. This is Dr. Stephen Greer. I wanted to uh, give all of you an update on what's actually going on behind the scenes um, here in Washington right now um, uh, after the uh, congressional hearings on Tuesday. And there are quite a few things to unpack here. And I'm, I'm uh, here having a conversation with uh, Blake Cousins. Absolutely. Hey, thanks for, uh, you know, this is pretty intense what's going on in Congress. We're just going to go straight to some of the statements that were made. What people need to understand is that because of the people I'm working with here in, in D.C., I can't talk in any specificity, but this is the first of many hearings. Uh, it's not the hearing. It's an introductory hearing. The other thing to remember is that following the public hearing that you have access to, and I have here a transcript of the whole thing, um, there was a classified hearing. So you need to understand that in the public hearings, uh, usually it's all pretty much bureaucratic speak and administrative nonsense. Uh, but I think let's take uh, uh, five steps back and look at what really happened on Tuesday. What really happened on Tuesday is the equivalent of uh, a story I'm gonna tell you that I think is very insightful and shows how counterintelligence works. Some years ago in the 1990s, I was working with a gentleman at the NASA Ames Research Center, uh, Dr. Richard Haynes, and uh, I gave him a number of cases, and he eventually wrote a book called CE5. But he was a research scientist there, and at that time shared a part of a building with the SETI project, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, um, of Carl Sagan and other fame. And the, the top people were in the building with him. And he went up to them and Dr. Haynes said, also to Frank Drake of the Drake formula, who estimated how many intelligent civilizations there are uh, in our galaxy. The Drake formula is a calculation of that. And Dr. Haynes says, what would you do if I told you that the SETI project is actually a, uh, an operation counterintelligence operation to make people think that we're looking for something when you know we've already had them land on the earth and that you're using radio telescopes to look for objects and civilizations that aren't using that antiquated 1800s technology. And this senior scientist turned to Dr. Haynes and said, well, Dick, I'd say that you're a very smart man. So what, these, what this hearing was, and if you look at it in its totality, rather than getting lost in the weeds, you come to, across with, with, with these, this opening concept that the Pentagon has only collected 400 cases uh, to investigate. Well, of course, there were several thousand cases in the Project Grudge and Project Blue Book in the 50s and 60s. Uh, the, the idea that the people sitting there have zero historical knowledge of uh, a, a UFO phenomenon that's been going on for one, over 100 years, since the late 1800s, is not conceivably possible. So you have to begin to ask the bigger question of, is, are they completely ignorant of the facts? which given that these are uh, you know, government bureaucrats, it's possible. Or are they uh, doing basically what they did with the SETI project and say, here we're starting from fresh. We really don't know anything about this. And deliberately making it appear to Congress and the American people and the media that there's no pre-existing body of evidence that has been run to ground thoroughly over the last 70 years. Now, you don't have to go far to look at that. Anyone who can read, there's a 500 and some page book called Disclosure that are uh, the edited transcripts of several dozen top secret military personnel and government documents that we published in 2001, as 21 years ago. Uh, in advance of the National Press Conference uh, Disclosure Project. Uh, there are other archives around the world in private hands, but also in government hands that I'm aware of. Uh, I have people on my team who've been in classified vaults 
where there are literally hundreds of thousands of pages of documents on this, as well as the uh, reverse engineering of extraterrestrial vehicles, et cetera. Now, these two witnesses, uh, Bray and Moultrie, they either are similar to Chris Mellon, either deliberately keeping themselves ignorant of the fact, willful blindness, let's call it, or they're lying. You only have two choices here. This was under oath. So if you're going to be called under oath, if you have that information, have access to even a cursory review of existing material in the public domain, never mind in these classified compartmented operations that people on my team have seen and been in, then you know you can't have it both ways. You're either completely ignorant and a very poor researcher, in which case you should not, writ large, be testifying as an authority figure in front of Congress. Or number two, you are a part of a deception. These are your only two choices. There aren't any other choices for people like Chris Mellon and these guys. Because you either know and you're not telling the truth and withholding information, or you don't know, in which case that would make you the most poorly informed person ever to be tasked with researching a subject of any type in the government or elsewhere. So that's, that's let's set the stage with that. The other thing to remember is that the real investigation that's going on is going on underneath those guys. What I mean by underneath is going on more quietly, sub rosa, um, is going on in a way where they have already confirmed and answered many of the questions posed in the hearing that these folks said they had no information on. That I know for a personal fact, personal fact, correct. So this hearing uh, is, is something people have to begin to, to really look at it from a, you know, this sort of big picture view of where does it fit. Now, what I'm hoping and what I've been told by my sources who are very high up in the intelligence community and what have you, is that there'll be many others, that this is the beginning of a process. But with that said, uh, to anyone listening, that's why I'm doing this tonight, is you really cannot erode further confidence and faith and trust in the government of the United States by putting on something like the, what happened Tuesday. It's erosive to public trust because anyone who, look, 750 million people have seen our documentary unacknowledged, which is chock full of cases, military witnesses, documents, evidence that is, and it's an hour and 42 minutes. Same thing with Above Top Secret and our, the books we have, Unacknowledged and Disclosure. Those four things alone would have answered almost all the questions asked in this hearing. And those are in the public domain and literally millions and millions of people have seen them. So what happens is when Congress holds a hearing like this and it's someone on my team called it a dumpster fire and it ends up being what you saw. And if you get the transcript, I recommend people get the transcript and read it. And we're gonna go through it today. What happens is that my bigger concern is that it makes a laughing stock out of the government and its investigatory capabilities. When I know for a fact, there are very, very, very good people who are doing investigation and who have hit pay dirt. Uh, so I think that they better get all on the same page and stay out of the public eye until they're willing to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. And if you're under oath, you damn well better do that because you're, you're brushing up against um, perjury, federal perjury risk, not to. So that's, that's you know, uh, some just introductory remarks I wanted to make. The other thing I wanted to point out is in the opening few seconds, the, uh, the chairman of the committee, uh, Mr. Carlson, used the term national security threat and that terminology came up with, by my count of the transcript about eight times. Now, the problem with that is that 
let's take another way step back. From the 1940s forward, this issue should have never underscored, been primarily led by military and intelligence folks. It should have been the scientific community, NASA, uh, and other concerned entities. Because once it falls into the black pit of classified military intelligence and military operations, but more importantly, uh, the old saying, if you're a hammer, the whole world looks like a nail. So if you're a military in your mindset, everything that happens out there, you don't understand, you're going to see it as a threat when it isn't. Now, the other part of it is that there is a big threat. But they're presenting this national security threat as something from external, with the implication it might be extraterrestrial or it might be another country or China. In reality, the people I'm working with have concluded, as we have over the last 30 years, since I first briefed uh, the president and the CIA director, Clinton's the CIA director, that the national security threat is from the secrecy. Now go back and look at my books and also unacknowledged the documentary. It's on Amazon Prime and Tubi and YouTube and see it everywhere for free. It has in there a document signed by the first director of the CIA, Admiral Roscoe Hellenkeeter, in a letter he wrote to the New York Times where he states the secrecy surrounding this issue is a threat to the national security. Now, that was written, I believe, in 1961, all right? So we're talking uh, 61 years ago, almost two-thirds of a century. This, this letter is not in dispute. So here we are starting as if we're beginning at zero, where they hit the reset button, like they did with Project Blue Book, and pretend like we're starting from scratch. And this is why we're assembling, and we need everyone's help on this, anyone listening who's a serious researcher, we're putting together the largest archive on SSDs, a solid state hard drives, um, that will be used by these investigators who are sincerely trying to find the answers. And, then hand, and I am then personally currying them and handing them off to those people. So anyone out there who has documents, legitimate photos, video, uh, testimony, whistleblowers, actual intelligence, they need to get that to us in the next two weeks because this train has really already left the station. And the reason that's important is that there has to be a extensive open source archive that both members of the US government, such as members of Congress, the presidential staff, the National Security Council, the white hats, the good guys that are in the Pentagon and CIA, and they exist, as well as the American public can access uh, that would have everything that is legitimate. Now, we are putting that together. It's a huge task. I have a team right now flying around uh, collecting a lot, but we need more and you can't have too much. So that's a request at the very beginning. Because I think that if this is a public, um, you know, a, a private public government initiative to try to get the people who are responsible for overseeing the U.S. government uh, read in, briefed properly. And quite clearly, you know, you saw what happened uh, at, at, at this hearing. The members of Congress learned virtually nothing. There were a few administrative and organization and bureaucratic, you know, um, things discussed, but there was nothing of any substance whatsoever that was revealed. And that's ridiculous. Um, and yet with all the hype and ballyhoo, uh, that, that should never happen. Because I think there are too many, when you look at the US, the last polls that were done, 55 to 65% of the US population know that UFOs are real and believe that some are from extraterrestrial origin. So when you have a hearing like this that's so widely watched, that undermines the faith and trust and credibility of the U.S. government. I think it's very counterproductive for democracy. Well, it seems also that they were wanting to kill the messenger in regards to some of the 
some of the private research groups like ourselves, yourselves, trying to spread the word on this. And they're bringing up a really provocative statement that got my mm -hmm. eyebrows kind of raised when they're yep. talking about yep. if there's any ramifications legally that they could do to people that go against the narrative. Let's let's roll this clip real quick. Sure. Uh, obviously, this topic of UAPs uh, has attracted a lot of interest in, in people that are um, curious about uh, this this hearing today. As we talk about, um, and I would say there's a lot of what I would call uh, amateur interest groups uh, that are involved in the UAP field. My, my question is, when um, there are unsubstantiated claims or manufactured claims of UAPs or kind of false information that's put out there, uh, what are the consequences for people that are involved with that or groups that are involved with that? So one of the concerns that we have is that uh, there are a lot of uh, individuals and groups that are, are putting information out there that, um, that could be considered to be somewhat self-serving. Uh, we're trying to do what's in, the, what's in the best interest of, one, the Department of Defense, and then, two, what's in the best interest of the public to ensure that we can put factual-based information back into the mainstream and back into the bloodstream of the reporting uh, media that we have so people understand what's there. It's important because we are attempting, um, as this hearing has, has drawn out, to understand, one, what may just be natural phenomenon, two, what may be sensor phenomenology or things that were happening with sensors, three, what may be legitimate counterintelligence threats to places that we have or bases or installations or security threats to our platforms. And anything that diverts us off of what we have with the resources that have been allocated to us send us off in these spurious uh, chases and hunts that are just not helpful. And they also help, that, well, they also contribute to the undermining of the confidence that the Congress and the American people have that we are trying to get to the root cause of what's happening here, report on that, and then feed that back into our national security apparatus so we are able to protect the American people and our allies. So it is harmful, it is hurtful, but hopefully if we get more information out there, we'll start to lessen the impact of some of those spurious reports. So, so just taking that a step further, so th th that misinformation, false narratives, manufactured, so what are the consequences? Are there legal consequences? Mm -hmm. Are there examples that you can give us where people have been held accountable by this misinformation or disinformation? I, I can't give you, you know, any examples where somebody's been legally held liable for putting something out there. But Well, uh, I guess what's the deterrent from people engaging in this activity? I don't, I don't know. I, I don't have that answer. I, that's something that, uh, you know, welcome the dialogue with, with Congress to talk about that with the members who, uh, you know, help legislate those laws. So it seems that they want to attack the Second Amendment with the UFO phenomenon, and they're going to use that maybe to mess with our rights. It was pretty much loud and clear that they want to maybe even change or ask Congress to change laws. Yes, yeah, so I think that that was brought up by a member of Congress, not by the, uh, you know, uh, people testifying. But I think, you know, that opens this larger question of uh, who's watching the watchers, who's watching the, 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 the secret programs. And when they're above top secret, when people I've met with, like CIA directors, like Admiral Wilson, like the people now who are in charge of the black budget of the United States, and they get denied access to projects we can prove exist and have now gotten them information so they can get in, you cannot uh, undermine that by threatening to criminalize private investigations on something like this. And I wanna go back, uh, what you're saying is very important because there's this tendency right now all over the United States towards totalitarianism, censorship, um, the infringement of free speech, et cetera, and so on. It's very dangerous. Uh, it's the worst I've seen in my lifetime. It's in the last five years. Now, this was the, the reference here was even saying, are there laws that we could criminalize? Say, for example, what everyone's been doing who's worked with me on the disclosure project. That's very worrisome. 
Um, and uh, hopefully, you know, that doesn't go any further than it being asked as a question and then uh, vaguely answered by the witnesses. They really uh, didn't say too much about it, honestly, if you look at their answers. But uh, it is, it's a red flag. I agree with you. But I think more importantly is you cannot criminalize an investigation or the disclosure of evidence, materiel, whistleblower testimony, government documents, no matter how many stamps they have on them top secret, if the entity that is keeping it secret is itself a criminal organization. And remember, this was the assessment we reached in the mid 1990s, is why we wrote that unless otherwise directed letter, which is what you write to agencies when, you're, when you say to the military, unless I'm told otherwise, unless directed otherwise, we're, our assessment is that these projects are illegal, unconstitutional, and rogue. Therefore, anybody can come forward with documents from any base, materiel, top secret witness testimony, and no prosecution, persecution, criminality is attached to that act because the organization that is holding all of that is lying to the president lying to Congress, lying to the oversight people in the Pentagon who have a need to know. And I can prove this in a court of law. Every word I just said, I can prove in a court of law. Therefore, you cannot criminalize people who disclose illegal operations. Because by definition, if the operation is illegal, it is a priori uh, not protected by the law. It's like if someone was running a mafia storefront and someone broke a window, they said, oh, you know, I'm going to have you arrested because you broke into my illegal operation. Well, they can't do that. You can't do that. You know, contract law and, and just basic uh, legal theory, if an organization is criminal and illegal, which this organization keeping this issue secret at this level is, they've opted out of the law. So they can't then turn around and use the law to prosecute, persecute, penalize people who come forward. That we put forward in the 1990s. And by the way, from 1997, 98, we put a 60 day timer on it. No one since that time has ever approached me in the US government and said, you were wrong about this. And because I know I can prove in a court of law I'm right. I've met with too many people over the last 30 years, cabinet level people, top people at the CIA, Pentagon, but also in Congress on oversight committees. Since the 90s, I've been meeting with people and in the early 2000s who were Senate intelligence and house government oversight. None of those people had been read into the subject. All of them, even when they made inquiries, were brushed off or threatened the way Admiral Wilson was. So I think people need to understand that an organization that behaves that way is no longer protected by the laws of the United States or any other country they operate in, in, in this fashion, in an illegal fashion. This concerning just uh, the language that was brought up, and uh, we're looking at it very closely. Another thing that caught my attention was the off-world material or material that's been recovered. And... One of the eyewitnesses basically stated straight up that there is no evidence recovered one way or the other. Mm -hmm. What's your thoughts on that? We'll run the clip. Uh, when it comes to material that we have, we have no material. Uh, we have detected no emanations uh, within the UAP task force that, that, is, uh, that would suggest it's anything non-terrestrial uh, in origin. So there's, um, when I say unexplained, I mean everything from too little, too little data uh, to we simply, the data that we have doesn't point us towards an explanation, uh, but we'll go wherever the data takes us. Again, we've made no assumptions about what this is or isn't. Uh, we're committed to understanding these, and so we'll go wherever that data takes us. Thank, thank you, that's, that's very helpful, and so it, I think it bears emphasis. When you say we can't explain, everything that you can't explain is in a bucket called data. Is that correct? And that would mean uh, data collected by sensors, visual observations, everything that we can't explain, quote unquote, is in a bucket called data. 
Right, a narrative report uh, from, uh, from the early 2000s, if it just had a little bit of information on it, would be in our database and it would be unresolved. I, I would add to that it's insufficient data. I mean, that's one of the challenges we have. Insufficient data either on the event itself, the object itself, or insufficient data or plug-in with some other organization or agency that may have had something in that space at that time. So it, it's a data issue that we're, that we're facing in many of these instances, Congressman. Understood. Thank you very much. Yield back. So you just heard it. Uh, nothing recovered, off-world or otherwise mundane stuff, if anything. Well, you see, this is another huge problem. Either these two witnesses have not been read into those projects, which is possible. Uh, maybe they're the people underneath them that are penetrating those operations are giving them plausible deniability in advance of this hearing to keep them in the dark. I mean, Washington operates that way, or they're lying under oath. So again, I get back to my opening comment. There is so much abundant evidence and test direct firsthand testimony and even documents of that are top secret that we've gotten about the retrieval of such a materiel and the study of it. There are, there are reams and reams of information on this that I've been providing and, and giving heads up to these investigators, where they're located, where the SCIFs, the secure communication information facilities are, and the deep underground military bases, the dumps, are located that are holding this materiel. And they now know. Now, whether or not these two witnesses have had the people under them or in other parts of the government not read them in on that, it's possible. I have not had a conversation with either of these two witnesses. But if they don't know, well, that's a complete failure of, uh, of being a proper manager and a proper leader and an administrator. And then why are they being called in front of Congress to testify at all? But if they do know, and they have been read into this, then they lied under oath. And, and that's, uh, of course, a federal criminal offense. So it's basically SCI, sensitive compartmentalized information, and we don't know. Maybe these two um, witnesses don't have access to some of these other projects that are above top secret. So either they're it's lying. Possible. Yeah. So, but but, really but, but there, are there, are, there are people working underneath them who are hooked into that system I'm dealing with. So the, the question is, where is the breakdown on intelligence? Or and if there is one, then they need to fix it before they go in front of the Congress and the American people again. Or there's a there's a problem with deception happening. But the, you don't have any other choices on this. You know, and there's a statement that was interesting where they said that they there's an authoritative that they answer to, but we didn't get that person's name. And who's that authoritative? Um, let's bring up another statement mm -hmm. about the. The, UA, the UAP phenomenon, whether the military has engaged them with any kind of firepower or have they engaged them militarily. And again, there was a reaction said that there was none whatsoever. Have we engaged in military action against uh, the UAP as far as some of the information you've received? Let's listen to the clip and let's kind of body language this. So we don't, we don't even put out a alert saying, you know, uh, U.S., um, identi you know, identify yourself, uh, you are, you know, within our flight path or something like that. We, we haven't said anything like that? We've not put anything out like that. Generally speaking, uh, what, uh, you know, for example, in the video that we showed earlier, uh, it appears to be something that is, uh, you know, unmanned, uh, appears to be something that uh, may or may not be in controlled flight. Uh, and so we've not attempted any communication uh, with that. Okay, so, um, and I, I assume we've never discharged any armaments against a UAP, correct? That's correct. So there you go. They're not, they're admitting that we haven't shot, again, is this uh, information well, that they're not privy to? Well, again, that's a completely false statement. Um, it's demonstrably false. We have the testimony of Mer Merle Shane McDowell, who was at the Atlantic Command, uh, underneath the sink Atlantic Command, uh, Admiral uh, uh, Harry Train, 
when we scrambled jets in the early 1980s and fired on a UFO off the coast of Newfoundland that was on five radar stations. We scrambled jets, fighter jets who did fire on it, but we did not successfully down it. And he is on the record and we have other uh, events where there's documentation and top secret military personnel in the disclosure project. I mean, go to my YouTube channel and you'll see. We have people like uh, uh, others who have actually been on retrieval teams. I just presented this new top secret witness who was in the 2000s, was on a retrieval team, uh, recovering both uh, extraterrestrial, but also man-made UFOs that were roughly triangular, that were electromagnetic field propulsion devices. And all of that we presented at the uh, conference last month in, in Arizona, in which that information has also been handed off to the government investigators. So. Uh, there are many, many, many cases like this over the years. Of, in fact, thousands of cases uh, where, where this has happened. And so for these people to say they have no knowledge of anything, uh, anyone who would, would just do a cursory review of the UFO literature that is out there in the public domain would know that that is a false statement. But again, and I'm not trying to, to just dump on government people all the time, but, you know, I've dealt, I've seen enough just utter slacker incompetence in government that it's feasible, it's, it's possible that these people have not gotten any of that information. But if that's the case, they need to be replaced with someone who at least knows how to read the case files and evidence that are extant that are freely available from very credible sources. So um, now I think the way they couched it though, is that I don't have any, in other words, the, the very narrow scope of this sort of dog and pony show, which is acting like we're basing everything we know on this, on, on these 400 cases that they keep citing. When of course, in the, in the literature, there are over 4,000 aircraft encounter cases and radar cases already. There are numerous of them, such as uh, Mr. Callahan and the Japan Airlines event, and I have the radar tape. And military jets were scrambled to Alaska for that event, if you read our material. Then you have this whole question of, well, uh, there are 3,500 cases where these objects have landed and left physical evidence, like at the Air Force Base in England at Randlesham Forest, the Bentwaters case. There are 3,500 of those cases. Um, there are all the crash retrieval cases that Lynn Stringfield documented and that other people on my team have documented. So it's very hard for me to imagine that you're running a multi-million dollar office. Now remember, the, the disclosures to your project and all this that you've seen us collect have been done without professional investigators, people working for free, no offices and no paid staff. Now I'm supposed to believe as a medical doctor and a scientist that somebody with tens of millions of dollars in their budget and the firepower they have in terms of investigation and research that all of this that we're talking about is off their radar it's, it's, it's mind blowing, it's, it's mind boggling. So again, you're either dealing with the most ill-informed people in the history of this subject, or people who are advancing some other false misdirect uh, where they're saying, well, we're just starting out, this is all new to us, we don't know anything, and that is completely got to be false. I mean, now, these guys who are new onto the scene, maybe they haven't done their homework yet, but if you haven't done your homework and prepared, why would you be testifying under oath with the whole world watching in front of a relevant member of the House Intelligence Committee? I mean, this is, you know, this is a, a real disconnect here, and I think it erodes uh, faith and confidence in the U.S. government. Well, it's embarrassing, actually, when they're trying to present the UFO <laughs> yeah. evidence, and it took them about five minutes, and they actually failed to even show whatever the object was, which was pretty pathetic. That's the best they have. We obviously know they got better, mm -hmm. especially the public has the information. Yeah. As you say, just so, independent, as no budget, and you, 
you're bringing presenting more evidence than what Congress did. Again, another thing that caught my attention was their lack of information or knowledge, like you say, in regards to the Mal Malstrom uh, incident, where the congressman was asking them to do an, an investigation on it, or if they know anything about it. And here's a clip. It, it's 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 kind of quite telling here. Let's watch. Yeah. It's also been reported uh, that there have been UAP observed uh, and interacting with and flying over sensitive military facilities, particularly and not just ranges, but uh, some facilities housing our strategic nuclear forces. Uh, one such incident allegedly occurred uh, uh, at Malmstrom Air Force Base, in which 10 of our nuclear ICBMs were rendered inoperable. At the same time, a glowing red orb was observed overhead. I'm not commenting on the accuracy of this. I'm simply asking you whether you're aware of it and whether you have any comment on the accuracy of that report. Let me pass that to Mr. Bray. You've been looking at UAPs over the last uh, three years. Uh, that data is not uh, within the holdings of the UAP task force. Okay, but are you aware of the, the report or that the data exists somewhere? I have uh, I have heard stories. I have not seen the official data on that. So you've just seen informal stories, no official assessment that you've done or exists within DOD that you're aware of uh, regarding the Malmstrom incident? Uh, all I can speak to is, you know, what's within my cognizance of the UAP task force, and we have not looked at that incident. Well, I would say, I mean, it's a pretty high-profile incident. Uh, I, I don't claim to be an expert on this, but that's out there in the ether. You're, you're the guys investigating it. I mean, if, who else is doing it? If something was officially brought to our attention, we would look at it. Uh, there are many things that are out there in the ether that aren't officially brought to our attention. So how would it have to be officially brought to your attention? I'm official. bringing it to your attention. Sure, so, <laughs> this is pretty official. Sure. So we'll go back and take a look at it, but generally there is some um, authoritative figure that says there is an incident that occurred. We'd like you to look at this. Uh, but in terms of just tracking what may be in the media that says that something occurred at this time, at this place, uh, there are probably a lot of leads that we would have to follow up on. I don't think we have resource to do that right now. Well, I don't claim to be an authoritative figure, but for what it's worth, I would like you to look in, into it. And sure. If for no other reason, you could dismiss it and say this is not worth wasting resources on. We'll do. Um, so there, there we go. No knowledge. I guess he's going to look into it now that it was brought up by the congressman. But isn't it interesting that these guys are the ones in charge and, again, no knowledge of some of these famous cases? Well, it's not only famous cases, but in the disclosure project, we have the testimony of people who were there. We have other people who were at NORAD who saw the transcript of the event, and we have the official government documents of that case. It's in the disclosure book. Now, I always keep saying this because everyone, nobody reads anymore. But if you read that book, and you can just get it on, you can get it online, get it at our store. Those government documents and firsthand government witnesses who were in the command center in one instance and in the silo in another, that's, we put that out there 21 years ago. And it happened way before then. So again, if you are doing a serious research on this subject, and again, this is information in the public domain that millions of people have seen. And you're there testifying in front of the Congress and saying you have no knowledge of a case like that for which there are government insider testimony and official uncontested government documents about it, then my God, you know, th this person needs to go to kindergarten on the UFO issue before they start testifying before a uh, House Intelligence Committee panel. You know, again, the lack of knowledge, I think it's interesting to note because they only want to hit on the evidence from 2004 and up and not really hitting on any of the evidence prior to that. And basically, they're not looking at all the bulk of Incre incredible evidence corroborating mm -hmm. because it's probably too smoking gun for them. That's where it's all at. They want to kind of just go on with the mm -hmm. tic-tac, which obviously I think we have our own opinions on what the tic-tac is. You think that's deliberate? I do. I mean, I think that it's either someone is keeping them out of the information nexus, you know, all the, 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 the available information, or there's willful blindness where don't tell me about that. It's better if I don't know so that I can be a mouthpiece to go up to Congress or to the National Security Council or to the president 
and honestly, without lying, say, I don't know anything. And, and I think that, so there's some kind of nonsense going on here um, and that needs to get corrected. They need to uh, become uh, more professional and educated on the subject before they sit in front of a, uh, a congressional hearing and in front of the American public and the American media. You also brought up to my attention that there was a portion that you probably thought was quite interesting in regards to the Wilson, <laughs> the Admiral Wilson files, where yes, pretty much very important. I think that was the most important thing of the whole hearing. Let's uh, let's listen to that clip real quick. Yeah. Are you aware of a document that appeared around uh, 2019, uh, sometimes called the Admiral Wilson memo or EW notes memo? I am. I am. I am not. You're not. Are you trying to I'm not personally aware of that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this is a document in which, again, I'm not commenting on the veracity. Uh, I was hoping you would help me with that, in which a former uh, head of DIA claims mm -hmm. to have had a conversation with the Dr. Eric Wilson uh, and claims to have uh, sort of been made aware of certain um, contractors or, or DOD programs um, that he tried to get uh, fuller access to and was denied uh, access to. Um, so you're not aware of, uh, of that? I'm not aware, Congressman. I think this uh, this question was very important. And unfortunately, again, you know, the people answering didn't have any knowledge of it. Now, remember, Admiral Wilson, this memo they're referring to is a, uh, a debriefing of the Admiral by uh, uh, this gentleman, and it was leaked out of Edgar Mitchell's archives after he passed away. But it was about the meeting I had with Admiral Wilson, who was the head of intelligence, J2, for the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And this was 25 years ago. This is 1997, April 1997. And of course, in that, Admiral Wilson admits, this is not in the, in the transcript, of course, the questions and answers, that he had found out about this clandestine, uh, beyond black, above top secret group, but had been threatened with demotion and, and more. Uh, for if he didn't back off of the inquiries. Now, remember that his inquiries about this happened after we provided enough actionable intelligence to him uh, through channels, courier, prior to the meeting. And at the meeting, of course, I, I brought astronaut Edgar Mitchell there um, so he could learn. He really didn't have any information on the subject way back then. But also I had my military advisor and a military witness um, whistleblower and uh, my assistant, Sherry Adamek. So that was going to be a 45 minute stand up briefing. It went on for, uh, I think, nearly three hours. Uh, the Admiral kept canceling uh, appointments because it was so much information being provided. But prior to the meeting, we had couriered over to him a, a, a cash of documents, government documents that had not been declassified, that had project code names and code numbers on it and other information. And based on that, just like we're doing now with, with people in Washington today with this new investigation, they were able, he was able as, as, as a head of intelligence joint staff to locate the offices and the operations, <coughs> excuse me, the operations responsible for handling this issue. And but when he did, and he started kept pushing on it, he was a threatened. And it says so in this transcript, the, the, the memo about Admiral Wilson making his inquiries. The other thing that's in that memo are the names of the offices, if you read it carefully, that he had found had operations that were in these rogue and clandestine projects. Now, the reason that is so important, and this is, I said this some years after he left that command, is that it's another exhibit, it's exhibit why in all the meetings I've had with people who absolutely, if these projects were being run legally, constitutionally, absolutely would have been read into and certainly not been threatened by a bunch of thugs which is what happened to the CIA director Woolsey, which happened to the president, which happened to on the list goes on and on and on and on. I've recently found, and this is breaking news, that many of you know about what we call the Christopher Cox memo. 
And Congressman Cox was an Orange County Republican with whom I met uh, many years ago when he was the representative from Orange County to the Congress. He later became W. Bush's SEC chairman, uh, Security and Exchange Commission. But at the time when he was congressman, he was interested in this and he was on the House Science Committee and Technology Committee. So I briefed him on this personally for some time. And at the end of the meeting, he says, well, I have never been read into any of this and I'm on a number of committees. And where are these facilities? And where are these uh, bases? And what corporations? I will say, so some of them are in your district, under your nose. So I created the Cox memo, which has been in all the presidential briefing materials and has also been handed off to this current iteration of investigations that are going on here in Washington right now. But we keep expanding it as we get more intelligence. But the original Cox memo and its update, it, all of that kind of information resulted in him, Congressman Cox, finding out enough that he was a couple of goons in black showed up and threatened to kill him and his entire family if he didn't back off and stop asking questions about this. I learned this from a friend, a personal friend of the Congressman about uh, a month ago. So I think that, you know, this is another pattern where you have government officials who have a need to know, you have Pentagon senior admiral generals, flag officers with a need to know, you have cabinet level secretaries and CI directors with a need to know, and you have presidents, all of whom we can prove have been either denied access or threatened worse by this organization. That is prima facie evidence of a criminal conspiracy. So this is not a conspiracy theory. There are real conspiracies like Iran-Contra or the mafia. So we're talking here criminal activity. And the fact that the, as much publicity as there has been on that leaked memo from Admiral Wilson and from the briefing we did, for the, neither of these gentlemen to have any knowledge of it, Again, it's such a failure of either themselves or their staff. Um, and it's quite possible they don't know. Then in which case, what's happening here is that these figureheads going up in front of the Congress, there have to be people on their team keeping them out of the loop that are keeping them in the dark because no one can be this inept. A cursory Google search of this subject would bring up Admiral Wilson's experience and what happened to him that's referenced in, in this memo that very surprisingly to me, a member of Congress actually knew about. But if a member of Congress knew about it, how can this senior figure Bray at the Office of Naval Intelligence and Moultrie who are tasked with this issue have no knowledge of it? You know, this is, again, it either screams incompetence and ignorance or cover up. Neither is very good, I think, because I think uh, the American people deserve better. The members of Congress who are sincerely trying to get to the bottom of this deserve better. I think they actually watched our documentary that we worked together on Above Top Secret due to the fact that we're calling out the major media by them sharing these obvious CGI application phone apps <laughs> showcasing fake UFOs, including the famous Corbell video that they've been pushing for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. And they actually had to go back and debunk it. But what's interesting, the news is still praising Jeremy Corbell for his name being mentioned. But did they mm -hmm. fail to hear that they debunked his video and they continue to show this? Uh, again, very- I, I, But I think that's dynamic. also, but here, let me comment on that. I think that that has been done deliberately so that all triangular craft are dismissed as drones that have been filmed improperly. So this then takes out of consideration, it's a way, it, if, they, if they push a false piece of evidence like that, and it's later proven to be uh, a misperception, et cetera, and so on, by extension, this is again, psychological warfare, people go, oh, all those triangular objects are just poorly filmed versions of a conventional drone. 
and when that's not the case at all. So I think that this, I, I don't, I'm not so sure that that's not deliberate. Because if you look at the, 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 the documents we have from the 1950s and the Robertson panel, the CIA, they talked about engaging groups to throw pie pans in the air and take pictures of them and then so that they look like a flying saucer, quote unquote, so that then the astronomers and people like Dr. Menzel, who was on the payroll of the CIA, where he was a professor at Harvard, could go forward and say, oh, see, this one's an obvious fake. Therefore, all of these dish-shaped objects that have been photographed are faked. See, this is, I want people to listen carefully about how counterintelligence operates. They're very good at what they do. And I'm not so sure that the pushing and pushing and pushing of this poor video uh, from Corbell is, was, had that as sort of a uh, underlying purpose, even still, because then people say they'll just dismiss anything that's triangular. When there are many triangular shaped man-made uh, electromagnetic field propulsion devices, and there are ET ones that are triangular, by the way, there are both. And I think that, you know, this is something that any solid researcher knows about. But, you know, even before that happened, there was an interesting, at 31 minutes, there was this dialogue, um, 30 to 31 minutes with, with Moultrie, uh, talking about their sensor systems. And it is incredibly off the mark. Now, maybe in the classified briefing, he talked about it, but you know that, Back many years ago, I met with a man who was an electronics genius who invented neutrino light detectors. And these are detectors that, beginning in the 1970s, early 70s, were put on the uh, satellites, the classified satellites, to detect and sense with their sensors uh, ET craft coming in from outer space where they then go from one, you know, a higher frequency um, resonance into three dimension, you know, because they're trans-dimensional vehicles. And when they begin to materialize, quote unquote, there's this burst of neutrino light. And then they can track them, target them and attempt to knock them down or capture them. So that is now almost 50 years on. So uh, now I can't speak to what happened in the classified uh, briefings. I haven't gotten that information yet. Um, I'm sure I will. But I think that the issue is uh, there, there, there are much better sensor systems than are being talked about. And so the public needs to understand, however, that the top investigators currently who do manage the black budget of the United States and do manage the NRO and, and the three-letter agencies, they have ne until I met with them, they had never been read into the neutrino light detector system. Okay, so it, it, you know, again, this is the problem when you're dealing with extraordinary levels of secrecy that become so extreme, they become illegal. Because then there are people who, by all right of law and order, should know about a technology like that I just described, have no knowledge of it. So I just want, I wanted to, to bring that up because this whole discussion that went on for some time about their sensors and what have you, uh, it wouldn't surprise me if these two gentlemen had not been read into these more advanced uh, detection systems. As we watched this hearings, it was almost like a going to preschool or kindergarten is in regards to some of their knowledge that they brought forward. Again, they're trying to protect their sensitive assets in regards to protecting our national security against adversaries. But they did, they failed to mention that there was any kind of cover up of the UFO phenomenon, that it doesn't even exist, that there's any kind of cover up. And again, you say there's, there's going to be new hearings. We haven't heard that publicly. But from what you're telling us is that more hearings are going to proceed. Are we going to expect anything better in, in the future? Or is it going to still go down this road? Or are we bringing well, more I, by having this I, discussion? I, I, I think this is strategic. Let, let me, let's talk about this for a minute. 
And this is a problem I'm facing with the people I, I, I deal with all the time here. How do you bring people for, to, from zero knowledge up to full knowledge? It's enormous. I mean, there is serious, I call it disclosure PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, because the people who penetrate the veil and begin to see what's actually going on, they are traumatized. I mean, I went through serious personal trauma in 1992, three and four, when I realized what's really happening here, who's behind it, what's being kept secret. These same people are going through that. Now, the members of Congress haven't reached the trauma point yet. They're still at the point where they have very limited, even the classified briefings. And the problem is, is that if you give people, whether it's the American public or members of the Congress or the National Security Council staff and President White House staff, too much information too quickly, they shut down. They, they shut down, they pull the plug, they say, I don't wanna hear any more about this. So it's, 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 bare, it's like walking the razor's edge, slip your cut in half. Because, and this is what we're facing. I'm being very frank with my followers here and supporters. This is delicate because you can't, you, I mean, I've lived with this for my entire life since I had contact when I was young, and then as head of the Disclosure Project, and as the repository of almost a thousand top secret military whistleblowers over the last 30 years who've come to me and given me their information, specific information. But if you're just now going, gee, the UFOs are real, and you're at that point to ingest this entire paradigm and all this information, um, it's a bridge too far. And I recognize that. I'm very compassionate about that. And I think that's why some patience uh, is needed here. Now, I think dragging your feet too long into this process is not good. I think what we need to do or create a series of briefing modules, level one, level two, all the way up to level 10 or 20, that takes people from the beginning in an organized, very hard evidence way, all the way to the advanced knowledge of the threat from inside, the existence of a transnational super state, the technologies that exist that are thousands of years beyond what the US government of we the people have access to, the normal government of the United States, USG. Uh, that, that information is catastrophic if you are the president or in charge of the Senate Intelligence Committee or Armed Services, or even top brass at the Pentagon who first find out about this. It is traumatic. Now for conspiracy theory people gobbling up rubbish on the internet in the general public, it's all entertainment. It is not entertaining. When you deal with the bold faced gravity of the situation and you are responsible and you're doing this responsibly, because you know, it, it then becomes something where too much TMI, too much information pushed too fast could blow up the system where everyone just runs for the hills and shuts down the investigation. So I'm trying, we're having to, we, I, we're trying to proceed as quickly as possible, but realizing we're dealing with, with folks who really are at the very elementary level of making the first kinds of questions. And that's unfortunate. I mean, this is that, you know, anyone who's looked at any of our documentaries and books would know more than the senior people in Congress. But that's the, that's the disconnect. And remember, if you're, if you're a member of, of Congress, you're dealing with a thousand issues, everything from the Ukraine to the budget to inflation to war, to, you know, uh, social issues. They're, they're dealing with so many things that the time they have to focus on any, and at this point, remember, the gravitas of this problem and the implications of it are not known to these members. It is not. I will say that with authority, with personal knowledge. And for that reason, we have to be a little patient with the process.
Yeah, it's a big uh, pill to swallow, a lot of information. It's bigger than just blurry objects in the sky along those lines. But, you know, is there anything else that stood out to you in regards to Yes, I mean, at, at 51 minutes, you have uh, Scott Bray, uh, ONI, Office of Naval Intelligence, say, when it, when it comes to material that we have, uh, there, there's nothing, there, it, it, nothing would suggest non-terrestrial origin. But uh, uh, a number of these UAPs, you said, we can't explain. Again, in the service of sort of reducing uh, speculation and conspiracy theories, we can't explain can range from a visual observation that was distant on a foggy night, we don't know what it is, to we've found an organic material that we can't identify, right? Those are radically different world, worlds. So when you say we can't explain, give the public a little bit better sense of where on that spectrum of we can't explain we are. Are we holding materials, organic or inorganic, that we don't know about? Are we you know, picking up emanations that are something other than light or infrared that could be deemed to be communications. Give us a sense for what you mean when you say we can't explain. Sure. Uh, when I say uh, we can't explain, I, I mean exactly as you described there, that there is a lot of information uh, like the video that we showed in which there's simply too little data uh, to, to create a reasonable explanation. There are a small handful of cases in which we have more data um, that our analysis simply hasn't been able to, uh, uh, to fully pull together a picture uh, of what happened. Um, the, um, uh, and those are the cases where we talk about where we see some indications of flight characteristics or signature management uh, that are not what we had expected. Uh, when it comes to material that we have, we have no material. Uh, we have detected no emanations uh, within the UAP task force that, that, is, uh, that would suggest it's anything non-terrestrial uh, in origin. Well, th what this says to me, if that's a factual statement, is that he doesn't have even an introductory briefing yet on what's sitting at Wright-Patterson or the Nellis Range or out at uh, Fort Sill at, at, at near Lawton, Oklahoma, or is in the mountain outside Seoul, Korea, that is an American installation we built to hold a huge ET craft we down there, or the uh, nine... Uh, ET vehicles and uh, dissected bodies that are underneath the desert near Fort Huachuca, uh, Army Intelligence Headquarters out in Arizona, near Tombstone, ironically named. So, you know, the fact that I have multiple people on my team who've been in these facilities and have provided us with actionable information, and yet these guys who are the authorities testifying before Congress don't know of it, is pretty disturbing. I mean, it's like, how can this possibly be the case? Except, again, they either are not being truthful, which I, I, I have a hard time believing they would lie under oath in a public hearing, but possibly. Or they're deliberately keeping themselves out of the loop or their staff are not letting them know so that they don't, uh, they, can, they can honestly be the front men saying, being called up and then, if you really don't know, you're not lying, right? So this is the whole, that's the concept of plausible deniability. So one or of the two things is going on, one of the two. And if they did admit that they had uh, materials retrieved, that would open up a can of worms. And obviously they wanna avoid that at all costs necessary as far as the language we're getting. Anything else uh, you're looking at here? Yes, I mean, look at the uh, at time stamp 54 minutes and i at, at, where, where moultrie says i'm not aware of any contractual programs that are focused on anything related to this other than uh in the navy task force and, and their own well this is ludicrous i mean you know uh look at what the head of the lockheed skunk works lockheed is a contractor and ben rich we have his written note that says that they are both ours, meaning man-made UFOs and extraterrestrial. And he said, underlines UFO as unfunded opportunities, UFO. He writes this in this letter. It's in my book, unacknowledged. It's in the documentary. And this is in his handwriting. It's uncontested. It's not a contested document at all. So now you go, well, wait, 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 wait a minute. That was dated, I think, in the 80s or 90s. 
And you're telling me that you have no knowledge after all this research and time and millions of dollars that there are major contractors from Booz Allen Hamilton to Northrop Grumman to Lockheed to a bunch of them uh, that are contracted to, to research this issue and the energy and propulsion systems therewith that attend how these things move. This is ridiculous. So again, you know, that statement to me was one of the most astonishing things I've ever read, uh, given the fact that, you know, if evidence on, about that we have collected, cataloged, organized, and put out to the public for decades now. Yeah, ben, it's, it's Rich, pretty... yeah, ben Rich wasn't uh, writing a science fiction novel. It was a personal uh, letter to James C. Goodall, and uh, it was quite revealing. What else are you seeing over there? Oh, I was just looking at, at the details of uh, <laughs> some of my notes about uh, how, how completely, uh, frankly, you know, as, as it gets further along and they ask more and more questions, how the, how the answers become more and more evidence of either not knowing anything or uh, just idiotic. I mean, Which the thing that sums it all. They didn't know anything. They're looking into it and they're going to be transparent as much as they can to uh, avoid revealing any national security thing. But then again, as Dr. as uh, Michael Schratt would say, a big nothing burger came from this. Um, what, what are we going to? Well, they, I, no, I think, you know, it's not a nothing burger because if you far as, have. Go ahead. Yeah. It, it, if you have something like the fact that this happened at all and the, and the fact that the people up there had no information, they didn't even have any technical assistance to run their slideshow and, and videos. That speaks volumes, yes. What, what, is, what does this say about how seriously this is being taken? I mean, anyone who would have a month to read through the extant already existing literature that's serious stuff, I don't mean channelers or what have you, but hard stuff on this subject that like in the Disclosure Project or Timothy Good's book, Above Top Secret, excuse me, you know, I don't know how you could have done any homework on, on this at all and or gone into uh, the files that exist at various websites that have government documents on this. For example, the most viewed document to FBI website is the one we published after we published it about the field officer, Guy Hotel, to Jagger Hoover, about the crash in New Mexico and Roswell, and the debris. Now, that's an official document. And that it was somehow down because we had a new, quote, radar system. Radar is a euphemism for electromagnetic weapon uh, in this case. And that was switched on and caused these objects to collide and crash. Well, that's an official, uncontested, original FBI document that's the most viewed document on the FBI website. We published it. Now, so if you were going to just do your primer, like beginning research on this, you would know all of this. And it, you don't have to go to tall tales from the internet and from ufology. Stick with the military whistleblowers, stick to the government documents, the known cases. That's all been put out there. It's all there. And so this is where I get very um, worried about the process, because I think the process, if it continues like this any further, is going to undermine what we're trying to do, what, what they're trying to do, what they claim they're doing, and what the members of Congress have ordered them to do. Because, you know, this is now in, in the bill. Th these are now mandated by law that they research this and report back to the people's house, the Congress, the Senate and House. And so that's either got to be done seriously or not. If it's going to be done seriously, the people in charge cannot stick their head in the sand and just say, I don't know anything about anything, you know, because it's been in the civilian domain. No, it's in the civilian domain because we've done our research for 30 years. And you're, you, this has been done for you. Now, if it's a government document or a verified person like Admiral Wilson, why aren't those people being brought up to be in, uh, subpoenaed? I have the names of hundreds of people like Admiral Wilson that can be subpoenaed under oath where they would have to tell the truth. And this whole thing would be case closed. All right. Now, 
that being the case, and that's been offered, and that's being provided through channels, why not? What's happening? Uh, why aren't they doing that? So it makes you wonder if this really is going to just be a wind, wind addressing and sort of a, um, a dog and pony show, or are they going to pivot to saying, well, now we've discovered this, this, and this. And this is why it's very important for those of us in the public, we the people, not to take our foot off the gas for a nanosecond on pushing for disclosure. Because if we stop pushing for that, um, they're going to say, okay, we've placated and sort of uh, satisfied these in initial inquiries by these very busy people in the U.S. government and the media, and now we can pivot back to the same old status quo of cover-up. And so I think this is where any attempt to hush up, censor, or uh, marginalize people doing serious research on this is very dangerous because I don't think in a democracy you can ever count on secret programs in a government really coming clean. That's only going to happen if the people keep the pressure up. No, I think their goal was to almost dumb it down by presenting the evidence that was very lackluster. They're showing a balloon in the sky, nothing extraordinary. This is the best footage that they, they have. And they're trying to dumb down the whole subject matter, but looking at the whole thing overall, there, there was a lot of uh, red flags there. What are we looking at there? Well, look at this one. This is a zinger. Can I read it? Yes, please. Yeah. And, and this is a quote from Moultrie. There aren't separate UAP sensors. There's not a separate UAP processing computer. False. My military advisor was at NORAD back ages ago, and there was Console 50 with the Deep Space Command that did nothing but track UFOs in space. And it was a compartmented, specialized computer. So either, but see, he makes a blanket statement here that in none of these projects do we have that kind of sensor system or computers dedicated to manning this. He sh no one should make a, a bold-faced assertion like that. He should say, I don't know. I haven't been read into. But to make this statement, it is, a, it is not a qualified statement. It says there aren't, there are not separate. And I know this to be a provably false statement. But it was under oath. So, I, again, he, these people, they either need to be very prudent in what they make a statement like that, because the members of Congress will come out of a meeting like this and go, oh, well, this was under, under oath. Therefore, he said that there are no sensors and there are no specialized computers. So we really are building the system from scratch. When in reality, we began developing those systems in the 40s and 50s. So and they certainly exist today in very sophisticated ones. So I think this is another example of a provably false statement and without qualifiers. You know, if you qualify and say, to the best of my knowledge, or I don't know, or um, it could exist somewhere, but I haven't been read into it. But that's not what he said. He made a blanket statement, they don't exist. Well, they absolutely do exist. Yeah, what a day it was. It was a week that we're all looking forward to and that there was quite revealing uh, statements as far as these blanket statements and the <laughs> evidence that contradicts these statements uh, over and over again. It was, it's quite revealing. You know, we got a few <laughs> minutes left. I know well, one of the things I wanted to point out is that we're towards the very end, at about an hour and 20 minutes. Mr. Moultrie makes the comment about a blue on blue events where it could be one of ours that we mistake i won't ask you in this setting obviously uh, to describe any secret dod programs that said i do want to make sure the u.s government isn't chasing its own tail um, firstly do you have a clear and repeatable process to check with compartmented programs about whether a uap sighting is attributable to a u.s aircraft uh, secondly, do, uh, does the AIMSOG staff have the clearances and read-ons 
that they need to investigate all of these incidents. And, 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 and thirdly, when your staff cannot be read on, uh, are your questions to those who are read on even being answered? So I'll start and then uh, I'll, I'll pass that to, uh, to Mr. Bray. So we're very conscious of the potential blue on blue issue or US on US. And so we've established relationships with organizations and entities that, um, that are uh, potentially uh, flying or developing platforms for their own interests, if you will. And our goal is to continue, and we have a repeatable process. I think we've had that process for some time to deconflict uh, activities that we may have to ensure that we are not potentially reporting on something that may be a developmental platform or a U.S. operational platform that is performing uh, either testing or performing a mission. To me, that was the most important thing that he said, U.S. on U.S. Now, I don't know if, he's, if somebody tipped him off that this was a big part of the problem, but it is. Because these, if you look at what came out through the uh, kind of false flag operation known as TTSA and, and people like Elizondo, that almost all the cases they were presenting were man-made U.S. above top secret aircraft doing incursions into airspace and facilities uh, to for their psychological warfare value uh, and their hours. So it is blue on blue, to use uh, uh, Mr. Moultrie's uh, terminology. But more so than he, I mean, that one little statement, I was thinking, yeah, you don't have no right how right you are, that the vast majority of, uh, and, and to me, that was the truest statement, although I'm not sure he, he didn't unpack it like I am right now, is that the vast majority of these encounters that have been over sensitive installations are, are our illegal covert aerospace program that he may not know about. But that is, they need to be thinking that way because right now they're going, it's from China, it's from here, or maybe it's from outer space and it's alien. Um, when the vast majority of the things that have been concocted as a threat and presented as a threat are actually been just made out of whole cloth by humans. This up to and including the abduction phenomenon, the mutilations, and let's not forget the 1500 pages of disinformation uh, that was released a month or two ago by the, the Department of Defense about the burns and the headaches and pregnancies and abductions that have been done that were put together in a file by Dr. Kit Green, Christopher Green, who's an MD and a PhD, who, but who's a member of the counterintelligence team, putting out false information that I've known him for, I know, I mean, he's been around for decades. And so that was released. We haven't talked about that from the Pentagon based on a FOIA request. Well, let me tell you, FOIA requests almost never result in anything being released on this subject. That was released for its psychological warfare value. It made it all through the news because why? Then it pre presents this as fear something, factor. as the fear factor. And that's why 11 months ago or 10 months ago, we released the cosmic hoax, which everyone can see, that documents what this long-term agenda has been to manufacture a threat from outer space. Because how else does a global fascist militarized group gain power over an entire planet? It's not through a war in Ukraine. It's through a, a planet against a planet, one against another. And that is really the long-term strategic defense plan of this covert group. And the way that they can achieve it is by utilizing these technologies that they have, that our humans have, that simulate or fake uh, alien encounters and incursions. So th uh, this has to be really unpacked for the members of Congress, but see, they're not even at that point of realizing that there are two distinct things going on. One, a secret government within the government that's transnational and all over the world that has 
a thousand years more advanced technologies than the U.S. government they know about has, and the extraterrestrial objects. And the two are deliberately commingled and put together in a confusing narrative like that 1500 page release because they want the public, if they're going to believe in this at all, that they believe in it through the paradigm of fear, war, panic, invasion, rape, all the, all the actionable trigger points that humans have when they're afraid of something foreign or some alien. So this is, this is classics, psyops, psychological warfare operations. And I, I think that, you know, we had a little peek into this concept of blue on blue or U.S. on U.S. and the left hand not knowing what the right hand's doing. Uh, to me, at the very end there, that was probably the most beginning of a hopeful comment. It, it did seem like they were uh, at least looking at the idea that we have technology and it could be blue on blue activity. And that was kind of refreshing. And uh, that language was proper. You know, we got uh, about a minute and 30 seconds left. Is there anything uh, else you want to add? Uh, what are you up to next? Mm. Well, I'm up to my eyebrows and alligators deal dealing with this here in Washington. But I, what I'd say is um, we need people who are listening, who are legitimate researchers who hold uh, archives of significant information, evidence, like I said, government documents, whistleblower, leads to whistleblowers, actionable intelligence on facilities, corporations, and very well analyzed and legitimate photos and videos. Because what we have to do in this, what we're, we're, we're back channeling into the government is the best evidence that we can get so they don't keep showing rubbish like that Corbell video. That's okay, right. So, so you guys should help us with that. There are a lot of people who, who are listening that have content. And what we're doing right now, just so you have an idea, we're doing a global scrub a scrub of the whole planet of everything that could be a legitimate source of information. That will then be analyzed and triaged, most important to least important. If it seems spurious or not legitimate, we'll just take it out. Yeah, so, uh, you know, again, if people can be in touch with us uh, at uh, SiriusDisclosure.com, S-I-R-I-U-S Disclosure.com, if you have this kind of evidence, archive, material, um, it will be handed off hand-to-hand -hand from me to these folks who are trying to get to the bottom of it. Um, now's the time. There is a door open. How long that door will be open, I don't know. Um, but I suggest we move through it expeditiously, quickly. Absolutely. We just received a video that we put up, and it has multiple angles over Hawaii of a massive triangular craft. And people are shocked. And we're going to send that over to you, and among other uh, evidence from the public that I think the, uh, the people on your end might be interested in. And uh, we'll be keeping in touch. I know, again, hopefully more hearings. We just uh, finished a documentary that we're on location with you and we're in the process of the edit while we're there mm -hmm. in Arizona and people are gonna be uh, blown away. There's the phenomenon was captured mm -hmm. and including right now above top secret, which is uh, breaking records right now on Amazon Prime and it's on the front page and it's, uh, it's being picked up. And I, I even think the Congress people watched that uh, we could hear their questions to the eyewitnesses. I think they were a little briefed or deep or briefed by our documentary. So that's a good thing. Uh, Dr. Gore, be safe. We'll talk to you soon. Appreciate it. Thank you. Keep it the good work. All right. Thanks everyone. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay. We'll see you. Bye-bye. See you.